special interviews, highlights, and live broadcasts on IDC Radio. Welcome to the IDC Radio at 106.2 FM or online at 106.2 FM.co.il. My name is Anouk Lori and here with us today is Adi Sharabani, security architect and strategist at IBM. Welcome, Adi. Hello. How nice are you? you. Uh, very good. I heard that you hacked into uh, your audience's phones this morning. How did that go? Uh, it was really nice, actually. Uh, I explained a little bit about the attack. I uh, showed how I could hack into each of the mobile devices of the audience, uh, of people who wanted to be hacked. Uh, I specifically took a lot of, uh, I, I had uh, invested a lot of efforts to make sure that I would not accidentally hack into someone that didn't want to be hacked. So this was the main, uh, uh, I think it was the, the biggest challenge for me, but it was work. it was good. That's amazing. Um, you're here basically at the 12th uh, annual Herzliya conference to talk about cyber warfare. And to me, that just sounds so cool, uh, you know, that people can just basically go to war today from the comfort of their bedrooms. Um, and, you know, you know that most of these hackers are probably like slightly overweight, uh, late teens, kind of eating chips while they're taking down the websites of governments. Um, and that just sounds extraordinary to me. I mean, it's a new world. You can literally do uh, go to war from your from your bedroom. Is is that you know something that you deal with every day? Yeah, so the world has changed. Uh, in many cases, the uh, sexy image of the hacker that hacks from his living room uh, is not always the case. I didn't but know definitely... that was a sexy image. I never thought of a hacker <laughs> as sexy. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, definitely that you, you can do it from anywhere around the world. And we see that, right? We see people that allegedly are from Mexico hacking into our websites, uh, publishing credit cards of people. Um, issuing attacks on our servers and uh, getting them down in a matter of seconds. It's it's really easy to perform these things for a person with the skills. Uh, and there is a, a huge gap today with our ability to defense and the ability of hackers to attack. And this is why it's uh, so discussed today in the network. How come uh, these hackers are so young? I mean, where do they learn all of that? You mentioned to me earlier that when you, you hire people at IBM, you don't necessarily look for people who have a degree in anything. They just need to be hackers. Um, how can a 16-year-old know how to take down uh, the, 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 the website of the stock, Israeli Stock Exchange or the Saudi Stock Exchange or the FBI or NATO? I mean, how do they learn that? Yeah. So first of all, there are two types of hackers. There are the novice hackers, uh, people who just you can go online and read about it and know how to do it. It's very, very simple. Now, usually the 16-year-old kid that is doing such attacks doesn't necessarily have to know all about hacking. Uh, it's a matter of downloading a program and clicking Submit. Specifically, if we're talking about taking down websites, you can go online and order an attack. Uh, you just need to supply the name of the website that you want to hack into, when do you want to hack it, uh, you know, at what times, uh, how much payload should, should be burdened on this site, uh, and obviously supply your credit card because it's, uh, it's a business eventually. Do you, uh, do you consider yourself a hacker? Um, I'm uh, what we call white hat. Uh, we divide the hackers community into two uh, groups. The good the guys and yeah, the bad exactly. guys? Right, okay. Uh, so so I, I, I know how to hack. I do it a lot. But uh, the purpose of the activities that I'm doing is to do good, not to do bad. So when you say you hack a lot, what kinds of things you do? I hear, by the way, that you're going to hack into my phone during this interview. Uh, if you uh, will agree that I will do it. Uh, of course. You just need to I, say I so. Agree. You don't need to I do agree. anything. Right? I have very but... exciting things on my phone that I want you to see. <laughs> I mean, do you do that often just for fun? Like you see a hot girl in a bar and you just hack into no, no, her no, no, phone? No, 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 no. You know, no that's illegal. Th th this is illegal. This is what I always teach my uh, students that, uh, you know, it's very easy to perform these type of activities. But we need to remember that this is you know, criminal type of activity. It's illegal to do it, no matter if you're just playing with it, you just want to see whether you could look at their Facebook account or not. That is illegal. It's uh, illegal, but that's what's extraordinary. It's criminal and it's illegal, and yet very few people actually ever get arrested for this kind of behavior. I mean, there are tens of thousands of hackers around the world, and it's almost impossible to arrest them. So when you tell your students, because by the way, you teach in a high school in Ramat Gan in Israel, um, uh, you told me you teach computer science, science, you know, 
just to tell them it's illegal isn't enough. How do we make sure that governments can actually find out about people doing stuff like that? So governments have uh, the way uh, to know uh, who is issuing the tax. It's not always possible, but in many cases it is. And we do see a lot of cases where people do get arrested. Obviously, most of the attacks uh, are, you know, most of the attacks are actually not known. Uh, if a major bank site got hacked, uh, they don't really have an incentive to go and publish this. Um, so, so, you know, many of these attacks are kept silent and many of the people that are doing the attacks are uh, unknown. However, uh, if it's indeed a very important uh, person that we do want to capture, then there are ways to do it. Um, before you start with the uh, hacking into my uh, phone, uh, yesterday I spoke with another cybersecurity expert who told me that no doubt the, the world uh, cyber superpower today is China. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, I think that uh, most of the attacks are coming from, a lot of the attacks are coming from China, and China as a government is also investing a lot of efforts into uh, creating a strong cyber unit. Uh, I would also say that uh, I would examine Israel uh, as a strong nation in this field as well. Uh, due to people that live here, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of security uh, companies that are based in Israel, that have offices in Israel. Um, there's a lot of knowledge here in Israel that is being developed. When I go around the world, when people hear that I'm from Israel, it's always, oh, yeah, yeah, security, security. Um, in addition to that, uh, the way we connect to the Internet uh, allows us to be, in some sense, a bit more safe than other nations because eventually it's fairly easy for us to connect ourselves from the, to disconnect ourselves from the global Internet in case of a multiple attack that is coming from the outside. Um, so I would consider Israel as one of the top as countries as well. contender to China? And that's um, extraordinary because so Israel China, there's 7 million people, yeah, there's so over there, a billion people yeah. in China. So we see a lot of um, malicious activity coming out of China uh, and Russia, by the way. Um, and this type of malicious activity is not the top end uh, hacking type of stuff. They are very simple stuff that a lot of people can do. So you, when you take a nation that has so many people and have incentives to do that and the law in there is a bit different than the law in the Western, um, then you get a case where a lot of malicious activity is starting from there. So you're saying basically, you know, China and Russia do the fast food of hacking and Israel might be doing the haute cuisine. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, in some sense. I like that. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, by the way, I would just clarify that it's not, you know, the Chinese government or the Russian government that is doing all this malicious activity that we see. Uh, it's different groups uh, in those countries that are doing that, and we don't know exactly who's uh, sponsoring those. I groups. mean, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago that says that China actually uh, uh, promotes uh, kind of uh, economic espionage uh, and is really uh, at the top of the of the cyber warfare and cyber espionage. So it, it's something to look further into. Is it really the Chinese government promoting uh, uh, hackers, or or are they doing it of their own willingness? Yes. Um, before we continue with the questions, I'd really like to see what you can do. So why don't we start with um, you hacking into my brand new iPhone? Okay. Um, so I will just before that I will explain uh, how why it is so easy for me to hack into your iPhone. Uh, the thing is that the internet was not invented with security uh, in mind. So the underlying uh, elements of the internet doesn't have any security mechanisms in them. Security was added at a later stage uh, as patches to this framework. So uh, for example, uh, in networks, when you connect uh, to a network, there is a protocol, uh, whatever, there is a process uh, in which your iPhone asks the network how we should go to the internet. What is the gateway, the way the, the computer that connects it actually to the internet? Here in the IDC network, there is an IDC gateway that connects all the Wi-Fi users of this network to the internet. So the process goes like this. The iPhone says, who is my gateway? And then it listens. And then some, suddenly someone says, I am the gateway. So the iPhone browses the internet through that person. But there is no mechanism for authentication. There is no mechanism for verifying that the gateway is indeed the gateway. 
So what will happen? So you're saying the gateway could be lying? Yeah. Or someone else could be lying, right? So what if my computer here will start screaming on the network, I'm the gateway, I'm the gateway, I'm the gateway, I'm the gateway. All the people around here that are serving this network will browse through my computer. And then I will be what we call man in the middle. I will be in the middle between you and the internet so that I will be able to see everything that you are doing and I will be able to manipulate the content that you are seeing. How often does that, uh, I, I, I mean, you can start soon, but I mean, how, does that happen that all the time? That happens all the time, all the time. Uh, we see it a lot in internet cafes where, uh, you know, you can't really trust all the people that are browsing that network. They do often look very shady in internet cafes. <laughs> um, so uh, we see that a lot it happens in those types of areas. Uh, many times uh, we see it in airports and in conferences. So I would definitely not advise people to hook into Wi-Fi of conferences. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it can also be it can also happen on a larger scale. So, for example, a few years ago, the Pakistani government decided to ban uh, to ban uh, YouTube uh, due to a cartoon about Muhammad uh, that they, uh, they didn't really like. So uh, uh, the internet suppliers, the ISPs, uh, got an order to to. Uh, um, to disconnect YouTube from their users. Now, one of the ISPs did something wrong, and I don't want to step into that now because it's a bit too technical, but they wanted to get all of their users to go to their site instead of YouTube. This is, this is how they plan to control the traffic to YouTube. But accidentally, they tunneled the entire world to their servers whenever the entire that. world went to YouTube. So it happens. A year before that, a Turkish person actually tunneled the entire internet through his computers, which crashed because they couldn't handle the, uh, all, you know, all, all the traffic. Okay, so uh, uh, let's start seeing what you do. Okay, so uh, look at my computer. Uh, what I have done here, uh, I'm running a program. I'm running a program that uh, did what I said before shouts on the internet that on the net that this computer is the gateway now all the devices in this network will browse through this computer now i would kindly ask you to open your iphone now which uh, is supposed to be connected to the same network as this computer we'll soon see uh, open uh, safari and go to google on the right and type something type facebook for example so and click and go and search. Uh, I know that uh, you click search because if you'll see on the screen, uh, I can easily see uh, that there is a user that typed Facebook as in now searching Facebook and surfing Google COIL and so on. But you don't yet, uh, you're not yet into my phone. Uh, no, but I can see everything that uh, you are searching for, right? So this is uh, already a very sensitive uh, action that, you know, a, a very sensitive piece of information that I, I could gain. Think about what if I would start to listen to all the different participants here in the Arcelia Conference of 2012 and look at everything that they are doing on the net. Including okay. the former director of the CIA and Including, the, the, yeah. the head of the Mossad. Exactly. That would be fascinating. Okay, so now I would kindly ask you to go to, to Facebook. Okay, uh, and I can see now that your name is Anouk Lori, right? This is your last name? Perhaps. Um, and I can see that you're using Facebook. The reason I can see your name is that this piece of information is being sent uh, through me. Now, um, websites use uh, what we call cookies, which are uh, authentication tokens, things that exist in your iPhone. And when each time you go to a specific website, it passes this... Uh, tokens to the website so the website would be able to verify uh, and authenticate you mm -hmm. okay so this is why you probably didn't enter uh, a password now this authentication tokens uh, actually identifies you and the website saw them and only you have them the or I simply didn't log out last time I was on Facebook Ex because it's not a yeah. habit of me to always log out so I have to log back yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. So the fact that you did not log out means that these authentication tokens are still kept in your iPhone. Okay? Now, these authentication tokens are very, very sensitive, right? Uh, these are the things that identify you to Facebook. So this is how Facebook knows that it is you. 
Now, they are very sensitive, but you have just sent them through my computer. So I have those tokens, right? So I wrote a simple program um, that takes the tokens that I've captured from your device and place them in my... Just one second. and place them in my browser, and hopefully, we didn't test it before, right? Uh, and hopefully, uh, when I will go to uh, Facebook with these tokens, with these cookies in my computer, these are your cookies, right? Then I would be able to see your, your Facebook. So I will zoom in here, and nice photo, by the way. Um, wow, so you're basically on my Facebook. Yeah, so I'm... I'm, I'm and uh, so little, so few steps. Exactly, I, I am a nook for Facebook. Okay, I can do whatever you can do on this site, and it could happen to to any site whatsoever. Okay, so for example, I now search for uh, Adisha Abani. I can see myself, and I can add myself as a friend of you. Can I do that? No, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will... after after the okay. interview, we can talk about it. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, in the attack, I did uh, something a bit more complicated than that. So, c can I take your uh, iPhone so the audience would be sure. able to see it? Sure. Uh, I'll put it here if the camera can. Uh, yep, we can see it. If the camera can see it. Yep. Uh, can you see it clearly? Sure. Okay, if you can zoom in it, please. Um, I'm not sure that we can actually zoom into it. Ah, uh, you cannot zoom into it. Um, okay, so look at it uh, and see that now. Just one second. For example, now. I'm sending a command to the iPhone to go to Google. So look at the, uh, look at the iPhone. Oh, it went to Google. I can type keystrokes on your behalf. You, can so you see that I'm writing? That I can, from your computer. I'm doing it from my computer. I'm not touching your iPhone. I didn't do anything on your iPhone. Okay. Um, and in the uh, presentation today, I also discussed, and I don't know if we have time for this in this interview, uh, but I also discussed. Uh, a mechanism that was invented, which is very good, that allows a secure channel to be made between the iPhone and the site. So, for example, people will say, okay, so in Israel, our bank site are very secure. Uh, we have uh, what we call SSL, a secure channel. All the uh, machines are connecting to our websites through a secure channel. Okay? So, okay, this is great. It's a secure channel, and if it really worked, then I would not be able to see anything because it's secure, it's encrypted. However, the internet was not invented with these things. So this is a patch that was added afterwards. Understanding, as a hacker, understanding how the patch works allows me to overcome it. So how exactly does it work? Your iPhone browse to a major bank site. Uh, it sends an unencrypted message saying hello. And the bank site returns a response. A response. Hello, please let's move to a secure channel. The iPhone gets that and move to a secure channel. So this is great. The problem is that the first request was unsecure. So as the man in the middle, as the person that monitor and can manipulate the traffic, I do the following. I wait for the iPhone to connect to the bank site. Or I make it connect to the bank site as I showed you now. The iPhone sends uh, a message, a request to the website saying, hello. I forward this request to the website. The bank site receives this message and says, hello, let's move to a secure channel. But the problem is that I do not forward this respond to the iPhone. So the iPhone doesn't know that it needs to move to a secure channel. Okay, so I can still have a secure channel between myself and the website. But the iPhone is not aware of it. And the iPhone keeps sending all the sensitive information in an unsecured channel. So this would work to any website that is using a secure channel. Uh, it will only work for users that are not capable of being aware, of, they're not capable of identifying the fact that it is an unsecured channel. So this is a tip that I can talk about later. Because I would never exactly. think of whether I'm on an unsecured channel or not. Exactly. So, so let's look at how, how, how it looks, okay? Um, 
What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to, let's say... By the way, this is, this is just absolutely extraordinary how in just a few steps you really managed to get into my phone. I mean, you could ruin my life like this. <laughs> you know, you could call, you could send messages to, to, you could call my husband, you could call my bank, you could, you could do extraordinary things just by simply uh, doing the few steps that you, that you took. Yeah, and, and it's actually very easy. There are manuals on how to do it online, right? Uh, it's very problematic. A lot of people are doing this. Okay. Uh, so I'll just show that uh, when I go here to uh, Hotmail, for example, I don't want to give a real bank site. I don't know. I don't want to, to offend any uh, bank site in Israel. Um, let me try to connect to it. Okay, just one second. I have a command here saying go to Google. So just one second. Okay. So I'm now connecting to Hotmail, but while Hotmail thinks that all its users uh, use an encrypted channel, uh, this device sends the messages to my computer unencrypted so I can see everything that you're typing, including your password, for example. So if I'll go here to password and look at my computer, okay, look here, I'll make my uh, text bigger. So I'm now typing A, B, C, this is my password. So the attacker can see my password. So the attacker can really, while you're typing your password, the, the, exactly. the hacker can see everything. Exactly. So what is important, and I'm now going to uh, disconnect from this attack so that you'll see how uh, Please do your iPhone. Uh, so I'm going to uh, disconnect from the Wi-Fi network. Um, so now you're uh, using 3G, the cellular plan that you have. Um, generally speaking, uh, 3G is more safe than a Wi-Fi network in which you have people that you don't know or don't trust uh, that are using the same network. Um, That's something that I'd like to talk about uh, with you as well, is what steps, you know, what simple steps can everybody take for this not to happen? Okay. So the first step is try to avoid using uh, untrusted network. And by saying untrusted, I mean networks which uh, there are users that you don't really know. Okay, this, this, the, the Wi-Fi network here at the conference is an untrusted network because you don't know who uh, uses it. Any person that uses this network can issue the attack that I have uh, demonstrated here. In that case, I would uh, you know, almost never be able to use any network. At home, network. you can use your Wi-Fi network. At work, you could probably use your Wi-Fi network. And in other places, it always, it's, it's most recommended that you will use uh, a cellular data plane. Okay, like 3G. Use, yeah, 3G, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so this is the first thing. But as I expressed before, this scenario of men in the middle can still happen in other means, right? So it's also very important that you will be able to know when you are using an encrypted channel and when you aren't using an encrypted channel, okay? So uh, when you go and log into your site, when you go and uh, submit your password, before doing that, Make sure that you are indeed in an encrypted channel. Okay, let's look at Hotmail and see how, how, how it looks. And I'm not sure that the audience will be able to see it, but we'll try. Uh, let me go again to Hotmail, not through my attack. So while we wait, yeah. uh, like I asked before, how how regularly do you think things? Is there statistics uh, that that show us how often people actually get hacked? Yeah. So um, uh, specifically for this attack, I don't have specific statistics for this attack, but I can tell you that there are a lot of research that uh, is aimed to identify the per the percentages of computers that have been hacked around the world. And there are some debates, right? It depends on the research uh, group that did the research. But all the numbers that I saw was around between 60% to 99% uh, of the computers have been hacked at one point. Um, That's extraordinary. Yeah. And by computers, do you also mean cellular phones that can basically, like an iPhone, almost be like a portable computer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the big challenge that we see today is that we start seeing hackers start using Wi-Fi phones uh, to hack into other uh, people. So no, it's very hard to track them, you know, in, in the real life. So if you are getting hacked, if you suddenly see that 
something weird is going on in your uh, machine, right? And you're in an internet cafe. It doesn't have to be a person with, uh, you know, heavy equipment. It could be someone with an Android machine. Right. So I can't necessarily point to the, you know, person with a big yeah. laptop. It could be anybody on exactly. their BlackBerry or iPhone or exactly. whatever kind of smartphone. Exactly. It can actually be a device that has malware on it. And there is another hacker in a different country that is actually controlling that device that is near you and issuing the attack from that device. So, Okay, so let's uh, go back to the Hotmail. Um, so if you look at Hotmail, and again, that's, that's different in each browser. Uh, on the top, you can see Microsoft Cooperation, and there is a small icon here on the top, uh, icon of a lock. Uh, you probably cannot see it in your screen. Um, we can see the, the, the small lock at the top uh, above yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, above the okay. URL. Yeah, yeah. So this is the small lock. So this is specific to iPhone, okay? Mm -hmm. Each browser, each uh, machine shows this, uh, um, uh, show the fact that it's now encrypting traffic in a different way. So you need to do two things before you submit sensitive information such as credit cards. You need to make sure that you are currently in an encrypted channel, as so you can see here. So I need to look, for example, an iPhone, I would need to look for that lock. Yeah, exactly. Uh, make sure that you look for that lock over here, because I see a lot of attacks that just place a lock, you know, uh, on the screen somewhere. Um, the attacker cannot control this title bar, so they cannot control this lock icon here on the iPhone. So this is why on the iPhone you need to look at that specific icon. You also want to make sure that you're actually browsing the website that you planned to. Because if it had a lock and it says attacker.com, it doesn't mean that you can send your sensitive information, right? It right. means that no one can see this piece of information besides attacker.com. Right. Now, no one can see this piece of information besides Microsoft Corporation. So you're safe if, you're, if you plan to browse to, to Hotmail. Right. So that's that's the first thing that I would need to look for. What about if I, uh, you know, if I search from my Mac or my PC? Are there uh, also locks that I can look for? Yeah. So for each device, again, uh, for each browser, there is an ability, a specific ability for that browser to reflect the fact that uh, we are in an encrypted channel. Uh, I don't think that you know I can't now show you all the different browser and how they uh, show that, but I think that this is the homework for each of your audience to go and, and, and check that. And the way to check it is to go to a trusted network, go, to ho go back home, and in that trusted network, go to a big major website such as Gmail, your bank site, and so on, and you'll see somewhere the lock. Identify that, remember that, and look for that again uh, when you use the internet in an untrusted network. Right. Any other major tips that we should know? Uh, yes, uh, most of the attacks happens um, after the vendors such as Microsoft issue a patch. So, and I will explain. For example, let's say that there is a vulnerability that was discovered in Windows version something. Now, Microsoft and researchers like us are working together to fix this vulnerability. Once they fix the vulnerability, they issue a patch. They issue an update to all of their customers. Now, the thing is that the minute this update is being released, all the hackers are starting to view and analyze this update. And they see exactly what was fixed. By understanding what was fixed, they can tell what was wrong before. So now they create, quickly, they create an, a new attack on the elements that were fixed, and they issue this attack. All the computers that did not update their machines are still vulnerable. So again, that, that's just amazing because that's something that I would never know. I receive so many messages on my computer saying, will you update to this following version? And it really bothers me and I never update. And I think, oh, so well, it's very, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't use my computer for much. I don't really need it except for typing documents. Why would I need an update? And what you're saying is uh, uh, while I don't update, all these hackers can basically – uh, find the the, yeah. the bugs that Microsoft was trying to to fix or Apple was trying to fix, uh, and they can now more easily hack into my computer. Yeah, if if you don't update your Windows machine, for example, and you do surf the net, 
uh, it's very likely that uh, your computer has been compromised and someone is using for your computer for malicious activity, either to issue an activity on other devices or to uh, capture sensitive information from yourself. So if there is one thing that I do want your audience to come out of here is make sure your devices, which includes the iPhone, Android, uh, and uh, desktops, are always up to date. And so what kind of soft softwares do I need to, to update? Uh, generally speaking, every software. However, we do see... I mean, see... If I, you know, I get every week an iTunes update asking yeah, me to update, to update it. Update it. Right. Yeah, update it. Uh, most importantly, the operating system, if it's uh, Mac or Windows, this is the most important thing. Most of the attacks are through that, but also update any other uh, uh, um, program that you have on your computer. Okay. I just want to show you one thing. Um, the attacks that I have demonstrated doesn't specific, are not specific to uh, uh, Safari, to the browser. They also work on apps. Okay, so uh, do you happen to have the Ynet app on your device? I don't. Okay. I just got this iPhone. I have very few okay. apps. So let's try to just log into to Ynet. C-O-I-L. And, oh, you're not under attack now. So while I do that, please continue with the interview. And Sure. I mean, uh, uh, we don't have that much time left, so let's see how far we get with the, with the Ynet. Um, but what I did want to say is how can I find out if I've been hacked? Because most likely, uh, just for the fact that I use the same password for everything, uh, that it's a short and easy to find password, that I never update anything, most likely I've been hacked uh, at least several times. So how can I find out whether I've been hacked and whether any damage has been done to me? So this is actually a very uh, challenging task, and there is no simple solution for that. Uh, major vendors, major companies in the antivirus field uh, have, you know, th there are a lot of tools that are trying to identify that either before the attack is are, is happening or after it happened, and someone took control over your computer. Uh, there are spyware uh, scanners, there are antiviruses, and so on. The problem is that the problem is that these products are generally uh, most effective in monitoring things that are known. So, if I would hack into your computer and do a sophisticated attack that is specific to you, then those products will not be able to identify me because they work by signatures and they never saw this attack, this specific attack that I'm doing on you. Uh, they are very valuable when dealing with massive attacks that we see. Every once in a while we see a major virus that is being released and you know uh, thousands and uh, millions of computers are being compromised. They're very good against this. But if you are a senior person in the industry or in a sensitive industry that someone wants to spy on you then, and have the efforts in doing so, then it's very hard to detect that. We've seen in the, I was talking yesterday, uh, in the last few months, really, the, uh, I feel that hackers and hacking has become much more political. It's been used as a tool against a government, against a country, like we saw this hacker called Zero X Omar mm -hmm. from Saudi Arabia uh, take down the uh, El Al website and the uh, Israeli stock market and reveal uh, tens of thousands of Israeli credit cards. And then an uh, Israeli hacker team called IDF team uh, hit back in Saudi Arabia, and, and it's starting to to be used really as a political uh, tool. Do you think we'll see a lot more of that in the huh. future? Definitely. I'm sure that in the next few years we'll see a major terrorist attack uh, that is being uh, made through the cyber interface. And what do you mean by a terrorist attack? Uh, getting down crucial uh, uh, systems for nations. Uh, we saw that in, in, in some uh, scenarios in Europe uh, in the last few years, in Estonia, in Georgia. Um, we saw it in some sense on Israel now, right? But it was very light. Actually, I'm very happy with the attack that OXMR has made on Israel because eventually it increased the awareness Right. of people in Israel. And they so, weren't too uh, dramatic. But yeah. like you said, I mean, you know, I, I was just thinking, well, a terrorist attack over the internet, what could it do? But at the end of the day, if it decided to take down the infrastructure of the police or, or the fire departments or uh, any kind of the major infrastructures that we need uh, in order for a society to function, that can count as a, as a real major yeah. terrorist attack. 
Yeah, and what we are doing, we are, we are attacking this in, in two angles. Uh, one is to try and make our systems as much as secure as possible, either by tools, either by education, either by inventing new concepts and so on. So this is one thing that we are doing. But in addition to that, there is also work that needs to be done, and I think that is being, being done, but not enough today, which is under the assumption that we will be hacked. How will we act? So uh, do we have the ability to upload secondary systems as backup? How much time does it take us to do so? And so on. These are things that are very important because there is no such thing as being secure. Uh, everything could be hacked. We need to be under the assumption that someone will manage to hack to us at one point. So there's the idea that we could get hacked, but there's also this assumption that it, Israel, as a government, is more and more looking towards uh, uh, cyber attacks instead of real physical attacks. And as we saw uh, in Iran with the Stuxnet virus, uh, you know, Israel didn't uh, acknowledge doing it, but the general thought is Israel had something to do with it. Um, is that something that you think Israel is capable of? Uh, Israel is definitely capable of doing such things. Uh, I cannot comment about uh, whether Israel did it or not. All right. Uh, shall we quickly look at the Ynet? Yeah, and... uh, just show you that uh, if I open Ynet on your device, uh, I can simply change the articles that you see. So, for example, I can put an article that would make you uh, perform a specific action if I want. Uh, again, it depends on the websites that you browse to, uh, the attack that I will uh, perform and, and the content that I will provide. So, for, for example, I put uh, in the main article on Ynet, I, put my own, I placed my own image and said uh, for the English speakers, the Iraqi hacker strikes again. I'm Iraqi, by the way. Um, Adisha Rabani has presented today in the Arcadia conference how he hacks into uh, the cellular phones of executives in the Israel economic... Uh... Is, that, is that you in the picture? Yeah. So you just added yourself yeah. into my iPhone. As yeah, a... it's, 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 it's not really a problem to do that. Uh, at one point, uh, Adi inserted this article into the devices of uh, the attacked uh, people. Oh, yes, and he was also elected to be the prime minister. Wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That's absolutely extraordinary idea. I'm sure we could talk about this for hours and hours, and I'd really like to find out more. I just want to reiterate some of the tips for the listeners. Uh, I think you said one is to always uh, uh, look for secure networks, wireless networks, or preferably uh, go to through 3G. Yeah, I would um, just clarify that a network that has a password on it is not necessarily secure. The question is whether you trust the other participants on that network. Okay. Okay. In my school, we have password on the network, but I don't know all the other people that uses this password and, and uses this network. So you don't really trust your students? Yeah. No, the, uh, the, uh, my colleagues. You right. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So the first thing is uh, try to avoid wi -Fi, untrusted Wi-Fi and use 3G as possible. The second thing, make sure that you know how to identify a secure channel on your device and always make sure that you're on a secure channel before submitting sensitive information. And, f and third thing, and most importantly, always keep your products up to date, whether it's a computer, iPhone, or even a, uh, a car. So people can hack into your car as well. There are millions of lines of code in any car that is being developed today. As a hacker, I could might, I might be able to hack into those cars and cause the brakes to stop functioning, okay. right? Right. Um, that's very scary. Uh, but one final question. Uh, are passwords really important? Is it really important that I have a password with 20 letters instead of five letters? And is it important that I do not repeat passwords throughout uh, yeah. several websites? Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, today the way uh, the Internet works and the way we authenticate to most sites are using passwords. And passwords rely on humans. And that is a flaw uh, from the eyes of a hacker. This is something that I could always use. So, first of all, uh, you want to make sure that you don't use the same passwords for uh, different accounts, specifically if it's... Uh, an account that you don't really trust, you know, for a system that you don't really trust, and your email password, 
Okay, uh, last year there was an attack by Turkish hackers. They attack into uh, small sites in Israel and manage to get all the emails and passwords of those users of those sites. So these were the passwords for those small sites. However, those users, many of those users, used the same passwords for their Gmail and Facebook accounts. Or bank accounts or whatever. Exactly. So now the hackers knew their passwords for those very sensitive accounts. So it's very uh, important to have different levels of passwords. I can't remember, I don't know, I have 50 accounts in different places. I can't remember all those passwords. What I do use is I have uh, uh, several passwords and for my very sensitive operations, I use a very, very sensitive password, very long, very complicated password. Um, for things, you know, I have a, a spam email, email that I give to anyone that uh, whenever I, I am required to give email, I give that email address. So this is a different password that I'm using in that email address, right? Because I don't want to combine the two. Right. Okay, Adi Sharabani, thank you so much for joining us. It was really enlightening. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Herzliya conference. Okay, thank you, Anouk. Nice meeting you. You are listening to 106.2, and I'm Anouk Laurie. Thank you.